Hi guys, uh, Daniel Guasco. I'm uh, one of the founders of Groupon here in South Africa. Uh, we sold our company to, well, original company to Groupon <coughs> back in 2010. Uh, I've been going through a sort of management buyout process for the last three and a half years <coughs> and uh, recently just actually stepped back into the business. So I'm, I'm, I'll be asking the questions because I think what we have here today is an incredible success story uh, <coughs> from a technology perspective. And uh, hopefully we can take some learnings from that in terms of how France has, has done that. Uh, so by way of introduction, France uh, is one of the founders of iKubu. Uh, recently, Heart of the Press uh, got sold to, to Garmin. Uh, and uh, while the figures aren't public, I, I can be assured that it's one of the bigger tech exits that's happened in this, uh, in this country to date, which is quite incredible. Uh, putting aside the fact that actually the exit to Garmin. So I think there's lots to, to learn from France in terms of how you got that right. So maybe we can start off with just a bit of background, France, in terms of what you, you know, kind of career-wise, where did you start? How did you get to, to where you are today? Uh, just to give people a bit of context. Thanks, Daniel. May I just remark, these are amazing chairs that Mike got for us. You should, everybody should come and sit on, the, on one of these chairs before the conference is out. Um, now, I'm... I'm from Pretoria originally. Um, I, I'm always, I've always loved people, loved business, and loved technology. So uh, I studied engineering at, at Tux, and um, sort of after working for a couple of years in the in the security field, um, I felt that you know we really weren't combining these passions of mine. It was just technology, and the, the corporate culture was was pretty bad. Um, I'm just going to roll straight over. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, Ikubu was basically a counter reaction to, to bad corporate culture. And um, we just wanted to create a space where engineers can express themselves. Um, the, the thinking was that you spend so much time at, at work that you really want your workplace um, to be a place where you can be the same person that you are at home. So for us, it was all about culture. It was all about the people. We didn't have a technical vision at that point. So, so we were sort of in the dark, just, uh, just bootstrapping, taking on a, on a small project, developing a, a micron meter for, uh, for sheep wool, just to get things going. And, um, but the core initially was just, just getting a good culture there. Okay, so, so what was the founder team? I mean, how many of, of there were you, how did you, you said you bootstrapped um, kind of what, what was that original vision in terms of what you're you looking to produce and how you're looking to, to interact? So, uh, myself and Dino Geldenhuis founded the business and uh, a year or two later we headhunted Nolan van Heerden who is also, I can I sort of see him as one of the founders actually. Um, while we were studying at Tux, um, Dino was the hacker with a heart and Nolan was the top performer every year. Uh, by a long way, and I was just the guy joining the dots, really, okay. uh, pulling them together. Um, but in terms of vision, we, we had very weak vision starting up. That was probably our our biggest issue. Okay, okay. And and so, how did the actual product come about? I mean, you you, you obviously you were mm. hacking around and doing doing some interesting stuff. I mean, how, at what point did the uh, the vision in terms of what you sold to Garmin? Where, how did that yeah. come about? How did you get to yeah. to the point <laughs> of discovering that? I guess that. Uh, and it can give you a bit of context in terms of what it does and for, for those that aren't, aren't aware of what, what you created and sold to Garmin. Okay, then just some, some uh, important background there. You know, if you read the press, that's, they talk about the startup exiting to Garmin. But we are eight years old. Sure. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot of water that, that has flown into the sea, you know, since we started um, and up until the point where we actually got a product that, that, that's viable for an exit. So, I mean, as part of our DNA, okay, is that better? Thanks. Um, yeah, so, so we've always just been about innovation and people. So while we were doing these projects for third parties on the side, which gave us a lot of uh, exposure to the market, helped us to hone our skills, um, just get the juices going and keep the, um, basically keep the money ticking in, mm -hmm. ticking over. Um, you know, we were, we were innovating, actively brainstorming with, um, we use theater improv. So really just using theater improv principles to get people in a creative space where they're being present, building on other people's ideas, 
um, and looking to solve interesting problems. So it was, was in this, this mindset that we, we basically came across, across an elderly gentleman right. sitting on the wrong side of the road. And we realized, oh, this, this is a problem. You know, this guy is too afraid to cycle with traffic because, right. you know, he's afraid of being hit from behind. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah, in that, in that mindset of, of just innovating, we, we joined the dots again and um, just applied our radar know-how to this right. problem. Right. So you actually started off in a consulting type environment where you were contracting yeah. into corporates and actually uh, consulting your services into, into big larger corporates. I mean, that's essentially your, was your starting yeah. point, right? Right up to the end, yeah. It's, yeah. it's yeah. Um, we, we, we want to be an amb ambidextrous organization. Right. So to be able to, to exploit, to make money, yeah. and explore simultaneously. Okay. Does yeah. the uh, elderly gentleman know who he is? Does he know he inspired this idea, or is it... Uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Not, okay. <laughs> okay. More anecdotal. Okay. So, so, uh, so, so what actually happened? So you saw, you know, you, you, mm. you conceptualized this concept. I mean, what, what yeah. kind of what was the path from then onwards? Uh, so... At that point, we've had, you know, we've had many failures. Mm -hmm. We are just normal engineers. We're not super business gurus or anything, and we've, we love innovation. So we, we tried these things, and lots of things just failed. Mm -hmm. so we, but, but our process allowed for that. Mm -hmm. So when we had this idea of the bicycle radar, I thought it was a really stupid idea. But hell, let's give it a shot. Our process basically allows for around a month of passion. Right. So where someone first Googles the hell out of something, and if you're still keen on it, um, you know, take a month, develop a prototype, make right. a thin slice, and then we talk again. Okay. And so Nolan van Yerden took his December holiday and, and then built this big clunky unit. Right. And so this unit was functional, and we could start doing tests with it. Um, cyclists hated the unit, but they loved the concept. Mm -hmm. um, and we felt this is now a good proof point. We need to get funding. So that was, that was our um, sort of... Uh, Next obstacle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we thought that that was the right thing to do. Right. Massive obstacle, right. and that was back in uh, in tw end of 2011, beginning 2012, and getting funding we found was actually really difficult. Yeah. So for a year we wasted time trying to get funding. Maybe do you want to just go take us through that process? I mean, who we say it was difficult. I mean, so what uh, what are some of the obstacles you, you came <laughs> across, and uh, you know, did you approach yeah. locally, internationally? What was what was that experience about? Yeah, so we were we were just local at that stage. So we were uh, we were approaching guys like Invenfin, right. uh, Technology Innovation Agency, and it wasn't that they were dismissive. Right. I mean, they led us along. So sure. with the Technology Innovation Agency, we got after a year to a point where they had a piece of paper for us signed saying they're going to give us money. Right. But it just never materialized. Okay. And and we got to a point where we we were actually just realized that this is not shouldn't be the first port of call funding should come later. <laughs> so the first step should be you know, develop the next, the next version because the effort we've put into securing funding you right. know, was, was more than we needed to actually build the, the unit. Okay. So we took three months after that, one person built the unit. So we're now end of 2012, eh? uh, yeah. give or take, yeah. Okay. So now, we've, now we have the unit, yeah. okay, that's, that's great, but how do you take this to market? Sure. And I think that's, that's with, a, with a consumer product, Electronics, that's a big issue for anybody. It's not easy to take that to market. Um, so we, we thought, well, being engineers, we need a big partner that can slap their logo on our device. So we went the OEM route. Mm -hmm. So OEM is where you now license your technology to someone, and they just give you like a dollar per unit sold, something like that, and they take all the manufacturing, do it, do it all, all on their own. Um, so essentially, you're selling your license, your... your patent that you've, you've developed. Yeah. 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 So, and we went to Japan, we, we spoke to Cat Eye, right. and they were going to be like the people taking our product to market. Okay. Um, but a year later, nothing, nothing's happened. Right. I mean, we've, we've done a lot of work giving them designs, helping them to get going, giving them libraries, and it just didn't happen. And we realized that nobody will ever put in the same amount of energy and passion into taking your product to market than you yourself. So the sort of penny drop, big learning for us. Um, so we knew we had to do it by ourselves. Um, and we were, we were starting to also realize that the first mover advantage was coming to an end. You know, we were the first, nobody, nobody had a bicycle radar. Um, but if we waited long enough, someone will have a bicycle radar and value will be eroded. Um, so in the beginning of 2014, we took quite a big 
a big step um, to decide on the, the crowdfunding route. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, 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 uh, so, so what was that all about? Yeah, tell us, mm. give, give us some context. That, that's, uh, so we were inspired by Knife Capital. Right. So Knife have this accelerator program and we took part in that and we just got exposed to people like Willem van Bouillon and you know, really high quality speakers and, and to just, to just sort of raise our thinking a bit. And That's the, the Grindstone program, eh? Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and one of the things they challenged us on was to say, you guys have money in the bank. You know, what are you going to do with this money? Because we've been you know, very conservative having to, to bootstrap all along. And they said, you guys should really be doubling your turnover this year. Uh -huh. You know, sort of uh, really, because our, our scorecards were looking great. We were like in the green every month, making our 40% margins. And they said, oh, that's, that's horrible. <laughs> you know, you need to then <laughs> up the ante. So we said, so, okay. Well, well, just to clarify, was this on the consulting side or on the actual uh, selling the product? I mean, because you hadn't yet. The whole business. Okay. Yeah, yeah. the entire business. Yeah, okay. right. um, so we had this Kubu Ventures and Kubu right. Labs, okay. two, two arms. Okay. Um, so setting these, these big goals really moved us to consider alternative right. means. We realized, okay, if we want to double our revenue, we want to sell a thousand backtracker units this year, we're not going to do it through, through CAD-EYE, you right. know? And um, so crowdfunding basically gave us a way of, of, of really elevating our profiles internationally and in the process, tapping into the international market to also feed into the consulting arm. Okay. Because the biggest problem, I think, that, that probably all South African businesses face is how do you get international network? I mean, the, the RAND is really weak, so it's an excellent opportunity to be doing work in Boston, to be doing contract work for people in Australia. And our engineers are on par and better. Uh, the only issue is they don't know about you. So, so a big part of our crowdfunding strategy was actually just getting on the agenda of the right people and we focused on the Boston area, because in Boston, uh, the time zone overlap is a bit better than, than uh, in San Francisco. And um, they also more, more of a hardware, academic kind of scene. And so we've, we thought, you know, that's a good fit. So we do crowdfunding based uh, with a company in Boston. So we get lots of credibility through that small crowdfunding platform, go out there, meet lots of people, and it was, yeah, crowdfunding was an amazing experience. Okay. Um, so, so which platform did you use? I mean, what, what, uh, which ones did you review? How did you actually get to, what was it all about? Maybe you can give us a bit okay. more to that. Yeah. So, so hardware is a bit of a different beast. Um, people always underestimate, I mean, with software also, I guess, but, but if you look at the Kickstarter kind of hardware projects, very few of them actually succeed. Uh, because, you know, the, 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 typically it's just snake oil. People... People have this great video, but there's really nothing behind it. And when they try to manufacture it, it's just a lot more complicated than they anticipated. So Dragon Innovation tries to solve this problem by doing a due diligence on the company before the campaign kicks off. So they give you a Dragon certified stamp of approval, and they also guide you in terms of your, your marketing campaign, all the different bits and pieces you have to have in place for your, your crowdfunding campaign to be successful. So when you actually then kick off, you've got a lot more credibility. Right. It's not snake oil. Everybody knows this thing is for real. Right. right. Okay, great. So, so you took it to my, I mean, you launched this campaign. Um, mm. What happened? <laughs> what, uh, what was the response? How did you, was it as yeah. anticipated or what, what no, kind it, of transpired? It, it was absolutely crazy. Right. So I can, I can really recommend it to anybody, right. you know, wanting to raise your profile internationally because... You know, we, we launched with a lot of fanfare in Stellenbosch. You know, the whole community was supporting us. And the next morning, I wake up and look at our crowdfunding page, and it's basically like 12 units sold. 12 units. I mean, that's just me and my family and, you know, employees. So, and we realized this is actually really difficult. You know, it's, it's one thing to get people excited and tweeting and whatever, but to actually get them to, to buy something is not easy. So our whole team transformed into a marketing outfit overnight. The engineers were doing their normal work on the side, but one guy would just do Twitter. One guy would be on email. One guy would be phoning bicycle clubs across the world. One guy would be you know, writing scripts to do stuff on Reddit. Uh, we were you know, just really 
all in on this, and it is, it's an incredibly crazy experience, but the amount of, of um, exposure we got, it's just mind-blowing. So, so we were, it was bucket list stuff for us. You'd wake up in the morning, pick up your iPad, and there on your, on your feed on Pulse, you know, you'd be featuring. It would be, you know, TechCrunch, um, Slashdot, you know, all these, these, these things that as geeks we, we love, and we were featured there. It was, it was really amazing. But now people comment, and not all comments are positive. So you need to now be like a firefighter, you know, running to all of these forums. Some of these sites, like Product Hunt, have live sessions where you're now featured. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning in South Africa, but you're featured on Product Hunt, and people are asking questions, and you have to be there live um, answering it. So it's, it's actually it's incredibly tiring. It's incredibly taxing, but very rewarding. And important to remember is you're not making money with crowdfunding. You're marketing. You're gonna, it's going to cost more money to crowdfund than what you're actually going to make. But it's a good way to spend marketing money, basically. So it sounds like you got some pretty incredible exposure. And, uh, and you're saying you pretty much just hacked your way through that. I mean, literally, just uh, it wasn't like you engaged sort of external companies via the platform. Uh, to actually mm -hmm. do that. I mean, you guys literally just, you know, started emailing, tweet tweeting, whatever <laughs> the case is. I mean, is that literally how it happened? Yeah, I mean, we, 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 after a few days, we had to set up a project plan, being engineers. So we had this, this nice spreadsheet, and yeah, we had to hack our way through it. But, but we got good people involved. Okay. So we got excellent graphic designers right. on a commission basis or, you know, a success fee kind of basis. Right. And because you need a lot of graphics throughout the process, and they were doing awesome graphics. Right. And they would proofread stuff for us, and they would help us with, uh, with the print, print media. Um, we had excellent video people. Right. Okukle Media, a local company, uh, made a really high-quality video for us. So I mean, we were doing a lot of things on our own, but we, one of the best things we were doing was getting good people on board. Amazing. So, and it was all mainly local people, right? I mean, it wasn't, yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's, that's fantastic. And so where did it end up? I mean, you, the campaign lasted how long? I mean, how many, a uh, couple of weeks or? Yeah, it was about two months. Right. Because we weren't doing well. Right. We had to extend the campaign. We were okay. failing. And, and failure is not an option in crowdfunding. I mean, right. then, then you are burned. So if you, once you've not crowdfunded, you're not going to get funding from any VC going forward. So you, it has to succeed. So we had to extend it. And, um, but in the process of really trying everything, you know, we were sending our engineers into Stellenbosch to sell to people after their bicycle uh, ride on a Sunday morning. You know, people sitting at Java Cafe, uh, and they were really dismissive. And, but in this process of trying everything, one of the people we were, we were selling to in the, on a Sunday morning, this lady was, was really supportive, and she bought two units. It turned out she was a Stanford MBA doing some charity work in South Africa. And uh, she said, well, she'll take one of the units with her to the U.S. on a family visit, you know, show it around. And, um, and she ended up showing this to a Garmin tester. And that was one of, one of our really key links into Garmin was getting an email correspondence because get, getting an email address of the right person is really difficult. Um, something else that... That we, that we were very lucky with is while I was in the U.S. Uh, making some noise, a guy called Ray Maker was also there. And he's actually based in Paris. But Ray Maker has a blog called DC Rainmaker that is really um, sort of a, an opinion kind of, kind of leading blog for, for the bicycle industry. And everybody in Garmin follows this blog. And when I was in the U.S., Ray was there, took our unit for a spin, did an awesome review on the unit. So then everybody in Garmin knew about it. And um, yeah, maybe one last way that we got in there, two, two would make sense. Since this is a bit of a hacker crowd, we, we also stalked them on LinkedIn. So you know, very targeted, uh, all the companies we were focusing as exit partners. And that was a two year kind of horizon we had. We were targeting them for different segments, different messages. So everybody in Garmin knew about us at that point. But then having to extend our campaign so that it falls across Eurobike and Interbike trade shows, also to just make noise, uh, we had the opportunity at Eurobike to then use this email address that we had to, to meet up with the right guy at Eurobike. And when the Garmin guys saw this device in action, 
they went out into the, into the streets of Germany, had to play with this device, and they were extremely excited because it's, I mean, it's one thing to get a review, it's one thing to, you know, to read nice things, but when you actually see it working, you know, then, then to them it became real. And from there, the conversation very quickly changed towards uh, aligning closer. Right. <laughs> So, so in terms of that campaign, I mean, so where did it actually end up? I mean, how many units did you end up uh, uh, selling? I mean, just, just yeah. So we, we got very close. We we were about an eighty percent, so about around eight hundred units. Okay. When when we started talking to Garmin, yeah. so we had to make a call at that point if we wanted to help the campaign over the line, yeah. so invest some of our own money right. to to fill the gap, or not or not do that, you know and. It was actually, it would have been a big issue had we gone through with a, with a campaign, you know, bridging that gap because you sit with a lot of liabilities. Because if you're crowdfunding, sending out hardware across the world, you know, it's, uh, I mean, the laws in every country are, are extremely different around um, RF, around emissions, certifications. You've got consumer protection kind of laws in every country. Um, so, so for us to have done that would have really compromised the Garmin deal. Sorry, it would have compromised the deal because they would have had to then take up that um, that support, the warranties and whatnot. So, so what actually? So where did it end off then? I mean, you, you did you? Yeah. Yeah. So, so on on around eighty percent. Okay. And um, but at that point, you know, we we sort of just informed the backers that because the way our campaign worked is you don't give money unless the campaign succeeds. Okay. All right. Okay. So we notified them there's something in the pipeline. And, you know, it's important, I think, to take care of your backers. So hopefully we'll be able to reward them in some way when, uh, when, when Backtracker is now officially available. Awesome. Cool. So, so is Garmin happened? I mean, so where are you today? I mean, it's, uh, you've obviously, uh, what, what's the sort of nature of the deal in terms of what you can disclose, of course, but yeah. uh, where's, where's the product? What, what's the next steps for you? I mean, what, what are you, um, yeah, give us some context there. Yeah, so for us, it's really Geektopia right now. We, we, we feel that we've acquired Garmin. So we've got this incredible brand, you know, worldwide distribution network, manufacturing facilities, you know, a couple of hundred billion in the bank. Or, um, so, so we can innovate. And we, the only thing that, you know, holding us back is really our imagination. So. Yeah, we uh, we're in a very privileged position. It's incredible. So and and so part of that is both uh, completing the, the the manufacturing of the I mean launching this product that you've created, uh, but then also looking at other innovation within within the garment context using the technology you've you've uh, developed. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah, and I think you know it's, we're a small team. Um, we've built up a special culture, okay. and we have to maintain that. And and they value that. They value um, the ability to innovate. And the ability to do that repetitively, right. we, and um, it's something we've we've been able to do, and we'll continue doing. Cool. Now, I assume Garmin obviously isn't headquartered here in South Africa. So the, the next question is: uh, Are you going to stay here locally, or are you are they exporting you to to, to where they do that development? So what's <laughs> uh, what's the plan? No, we're we're staying in Stellenbosch. Right. So I think it's great for the for the local um, tech scene, you know, to to get sort of that exposure, and um, I think. I mean, Garmin are really impressed with the local companies, you know, what, what they've seen so far. And I, and I really think that um, their, their other uh, compatriots in the U.S. aren't going to be far, far off, you know, in starting to shop around here. It's, I mean, the, the, the quality of the companies, um, you know, it's, it's really good. And, um, I mean, companies like HealthQ in Stellenbosch, uh, um, yeah, it's, 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 there's just a, a host of companies that are really world leaders, right. but it's just not on the map quite yet. Sure. So for them, it's, it's actually a great place to come and shop. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, what were, you know, like when if you look back at the journey, I mean, what were some of the pivotal points from a learning's perspective? Uh, you know, what were some of the takeaways that you had going down that journey and mm. things that maybe you could sort of offer as advice to, to, uh, to those out there maybe in a similar situation? Yeah. So just a proviso, you know, every, anything I say, you know, is related to our journey. And obviously, every company has its own journey and its own challenges. So it's not necessarily applicable to your journey. So you have to sort of take out of it what makes sense for you. Um, for us, you know, something that, that took a while is to find a, that a golden thread, we call it. Um, 
vision is sort of the, the normal way of, of, I think, framing that. And, you know, every year we had these strategy workshops, uh, not, not typical corporate, more, you know, really just grappling with what is it that we want to be, what do we want to do, grappling with our values and identity. And, and I think once we started finding that golden thread, it really energized the whole team and it gave us a lot of direction. And that allows, uh, allowed us to create long-term value, where before we had that, we were very short-term oriented. So, so that would be number one, I think, have, have a clear vision and not, not, not in terms of, of closing off any possibility for emergence, but just having something that you can rally around that sort of remains. I mean, um, I think I'd also add that your, your um, determination around not being diverted from that vision, because I guess you, along that way, um, you know, you weren't raising the money, the, the crowdfunding campaign maybe didn't quite work out as you, you know, mm. through that, it was like, there are many reasons why maybe you, you could have swayed from that vision and, and altered that, but you, st you stuck at that vision, mm. which is uh, quite key, I think. Yeah, so I, I think you, you're hitting the nail on the head, so perseverance. Yeah. I mean, we... Uh, as entrepreneurs sometimes really have to to sort of scrape the bottom of the barrel and you know you get offers from everywhere uh, your your best people get offers from everywhere and you know to persevere and, and stay the course is not easy but that's essential I think if, you do, if you're not going to persevere you're never going to make it in, in, a, in a small business um, but then it's also really important to have fun you know it's it's really about the journey so when you now get this big exit, lots of money, um, you know, great opportunities, then reflect on the, reflecting back, you know, it's actually sort of crystallizes that it's not about the, 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 the goal, it's about the journey. It's almost, I think a lot of people can almost get depressed. And Daniel, I don't know if, if, if you've been there. Um, you know, but just the realization that if, if you're not having fun along the way, if you're not expressing yourself, if you're not doing something you love, you're actually just wasting your, your time. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I think, uh, I suppose, the journey you've had to go on, which is the one that I've ended and restarted, but, uh, you know, having obviously sold our business to, to a global corporate listed entity, uh, as an entrepreneur, that can be, can be quite foreign to, to you. And, uh, you know, I, off the record, re recall days towards the end of that journey, which were fairly... Uh, uh, you know, fairly frustrating because literally you, you're part of a massive corporate and you, uh, you that entrepreneurial flair, that, that uh, innovation component of what you could do and how you could operate is obviously gone. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, I can very much relate to that, yeah. Yeah, and then something that, that, that's also dawned on me is really, you know, we were never focused on exit. And I think that's great about South African companies that we're building value. We're building real value because... Exit is not really something that's in the vocabulary almost here. But there's a massive opportunity if you're able to bridge the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, the valuations in Europe are about three to five times bigger than in South Africa. The valuations in the US, it's again three to five times bigger than Europe. So you're getting an amazing multiple if you can get investment or get an exit in the US. So if, you know, a piece of advice, I guess, would be to really build that network in the U.S., grow that over time, and if you take investment, try and take it there. You know, don't, uh, don't, don't sell your company in South Africa if you haven't really considered the options in the U available out there. Yeah, again, I think that's very, uh, very relevant advice, and, uh, you know, I guess from ourselves as well, we, uh, we ended up exiting to a U.S. company, and... Um, we would never ever have got the the type of valuation or multiple out of that if it was was a local in the company. And uh, I think the other point, and I think just listening to your story as well, is that we often think, how do we do that? You know, how do you how do you get uh, how do you get in contact with the Garmin's, uh, the the multi sort of list of companies? Who do you speak to? Uh, and often it isn't that complicated, right? I mean, it, if you look at the process that you went through, at the end of the day, it was actually just it was a lucky break in terms of something, someone having the right uh, connection to put it in front of the right person. Um, and I guess if I look at my, our situation as well, we used to email, why well, used to email the, uh, the founder CEO of, of, uh, of Groupon, which was our target exit, uh, literally on a bi-weekly basis with an update on, on our figures. Uh, and I think he got so sick and tired, I didn't even have his email address, I used to use Andrew, Andrew.Mason, Andrew M, 
uh, until one day he actually emailed, well, he referred it to M&A and we, we essentially did a deal. So, yeah, it's, uh, often these things seem difficult, but actually when you start trying them, uh, are not as difficult. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and I think the, the network in the U.S. is actually quite accessible. Um, I, I, I visited twice last year to try and, um, and grow the network. And um, I mean, in New York, Silicon Alley, um, it's so easy to just start tapping into that network. People are ref you know, refer you freely, they help you. Um, they've got a very giving culture. It's really giving first. And they want you to succeed. So, you know, if, if you get involved in the um, meetups there, um, relevant to your business, you know, the forums, and, and you, you're in it to network, um, you can really achieve a lot. Cool. Oh. cool. I think that's, uh, that's pretty much um, brings to end to, to sort of the interview process, but we're going to open it up to the floor for, for questions. So hopefully you guys have got some questions for France and... Uh, Take it from there. Okay, so we've got the first one over there. Well, Franz, I want to congratulate you for owning Garmin now. I've got a problem with my Garmin. Can I bring it to you? <laughs> um, you've touched on an incredibly valuable point there about surrounding yourself with good quality people and the right people. Now that you're moving into this corporate environment, your Garmin, I, I assume, is a corporate now. How do you retain those people? How do you excite them? Because it's one thing to have an exciting ping pong team when you, you have a startup, but when you grow into this bigger one, you, you have to keep those people. And those are the exciting people. How do you do that? I think that it's sort of uh, probably the same answer I would, would have given a year ago. I don't think it gets easier, but it's all about ownership for us. So ownership. You know, is when someone gets to work and, you know, he takes, <coughs> excuse me, he takes responsibility, he gets toilet paper if there's no toilet paper. Okay, and not because it's in his job title, but because he takes ownership of, of the business. So how do you give people ownership? And, and that's not really about giving people shares. It's really about giving people responsibility, um, well, allowing people to take up responsibility and give them authority with that. So, I mean, every business, I guess, very different. For us, you know, we, we've got a team of really smart engineers. We don't like to be told what to do. So, we, you know, my, my job as, as, um, as CEO has always just been to create an environment where they can flourish. Um, Yeah, I guess it's, you know, we've got a real sincere focus on, on, uh, on valuing people, keeping people um, happy on a, on a wholeness level. You know, so making sure they're, they, they're exercising, making sure they're eating healthy food, making sure we, we get time to socialize, innovate. And, and that's really just a cultural, cultural thing that I guess you need to drive. But there's no silver bullet. I think we had a question down there, and then we'll go back. Yeah. Hi there, Franz. Um, congrats on, on your, your deal. Can That's you give cool. us, as much as you're able to divulge, so you've done the deal, you've made the sale. What is the state of, you, of your team, of yourself? Are you now employees of Garmin? Are you tied in for a period of time? Um, what happens to the startup team that sold out? Um, and what, is, what does your future look like for the next couple of years? So, so we don't have a tie-in period. Um, you know, we, in, in a few weeks ago, they dropped off uh, like a ton and a half of IT equipment at the office. They flew down a bunch of people from the UK, IT people, to, to come and rig up the office and, you know, just give, get everybody brand new laptops and screens and put in a massive server rack. So for us, it's an exciting time. You know, it's, it's like we get a lot of new toys, uh, you know, we're, we're having fun, but I think in, this, at this, in the same breath, we realize that we have to manage the boundaries sort of that, so that we don't get all swallowed up, you know, and everyone starts to take sick leave because they are due sick leave. Um, what, what the future holds, I guess, 
you know, as long as we can, can keep on innovating and having fun at Garmin, you know, we'll probably stick around. Um, you know, there's no gun being held to our heads. Um, but we always aim to disrupt and aim to do interesting things. And, and I think there's so much happening in the tech scene that, that ultimately we'd like to get involved also with, uh, with startup companies, you know, just paying it forward, maybe doing a bit of angel investing. Um, yeah, being, being in the hunt. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, one thing in the previous talk as well is just around setting expectations and around we, like, tech crunch and, um, and sort of international things around amount of investment or amount of exits and stuff. And my question is kind of to both of you is what is the reason on why South African exits or South African investments are always kept under wraps and those numbers are never talked about? Um, what is the thinking around that and how can we actually change that to be able to set local entrepreneurs' expectations? Better. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting question. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not. I mean, I guess it's typically dictated by the um, uh, by the acquirer. It certainly was in our case, and uh, um, you know, for whatever reason, they they restrict that uh, from being public. <laughs> um, but uh, give me a few drinks, I could share that. But <laughs> that's not really the point. I mean, I think, I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm not too sure why, and I'm not sure how you change that. I think the point is that I think people need to understand that those opportunities are there, and they can be fairly substantial if you get them right. And uh, to Francis' point earlier, those multiples are far greater than what you would get locally. That's just simply the reality because it's a more competitive market, and uh, um, there's more people vying for that same opportunity. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I can give a better answer than that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I guess it's just negotiation for them. I mean, they it just makes it easier for them to negotiate with the next company if, if there aren't pegs in the ground. So it's just one of those things. We just need to make noise, I think, around um, the possibility of exiting. And I think that's, that's basically why I'm here. I mean, I had a scrum session with my team this morning, and I had to get stuck on the N2 on my way here to, to be here. It's not, not to raise our profile, but it's, it's to to make noise and so the community can understand that there is this, this possibility and something to aspire to. Um, and I think it's, it's a responsibility for all of us to really to make a big noise about this kind of thing.